The road movie as a cinematic genre emerged after World War II and reflected both the advent of the automobile as a fundamental expression of individualism and the emergence of a mobile young suburban population looking for adventure. The combination of these elements, plus the exploration of male sexual desire among working class and rural men, were brought together by Joe Gage in his Working Man trilogy. In this episode, we're going to celebrate Joe Gage's Kansas City Trucking Company, a gay porn film that when released was viewed more than just a gay porn film and would help viewers imagine a world of gay men outside of coastal cities. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Aika Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Before we continue, I want to remind you that you can help this channel and its original yet risque content by liking, clicking the subscribe button, or selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. And for all you podcast listeners, leave a review or rate it if you can. Thank you. It had been almost 10 years since Joe Gage had read an article by Vincent Canby the daily film critic from the New York Times, that had started him thinking about making sex films. Camby's article was about the proliferation of theaters showing sexploitation movies, low-budget, sensationalistic, feature-length movies made with plenty of violence, sex, and nudity. The article stressed the movie's profitability. Kincaid was intrigued by the possibility, and whenever he was on set making a TV commercial, he began to pay attention to the production process. He began thinking about making a gay hardcore film, and performed in one a movie called Morning, Noon, and Night in order to see what it was like to have sex in front of a camera. In 1975, Kincaid shopped around a script for a gay hardcore road picture called Highway Fantasies. Eventually, Kincaid and his friend, under the names Joe and Sam Gage, raised the money to produce it themselves. The movie would be called Kansas City Trucking Company. The film would be a journey filled with travel and sexual episodes. It would also be a journey of self-discovery. Gage was an avid fan of B-movies, horror movies, and biker flicks, like The Wild Angels. At a time when Wakefield Pool brought an artistic visual to these films, Gage was thinking along the lines of a Tom of Finland B-movie. Wakefield's was art. It was like museum quality, something could be seen in a, a, that kind of a setting. I was doing something that was really had a beginning, a middle, and an end, an arc, character arcs, the whole nine yards, and uh, it was new. And at a time when the U.S. was seen as New York and Los Angeles, Gage wanted a desert filled with cactus, open land, and of course, cowboys. The first person Gage cast in the film was Richard Locke. Gage had seen him in a poster for a hardcore film called Pool Party at the Adonis Theater and said, that's Hank. Locating the actor, however, proved very difficult since Locke was out in the desert, living in a shack with no running water, a generator for electricity where he was building a geodesic dome. Richard Locke was a, essentially a desert rat. He lived out in, the, uh, uh, out in the desert out in Palm Springs. Gage was surprised to find the clean-shaven Locke now had a full thick beard with gray on both sides. Locke offered to shave his beard before starting the movie, but Gage told him not to. Gage would then cast Jack Wrangler because the camera loved him. He was an animalistic sexual being. When they set up their interview, Wrangler walked in and told Gage, You're shocked, right? When Gage would ask why, Wrangler said, Because I'm so short. That didn't bother Gage, who considered Wrangler one of the most professional, courteous, and agreeable actors to work with. In casting the part that would go to Steve Boyd, Gage went to San Francisco and interviewed guys at Wakefield Pool's place. Steve Boyd was a garbage man. Worked for the, uh, worked for the city pulling garbage. Boyd walked in with a friend, who had one credit in the industry to his name, However, he was hesitant to appear in another film since he was under the impression that a record executive friend was going to give him a recording contract. When Gage heard that, the part went to Boyd. The truck was rented from a trucking company and they needed a guy with an 18-wheeler license to drive it. When they didn't have money to rent the entire truck, they would just rent the cab. The other people besides the, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of secondary group of performers were just people we knew or people who knew people who said, you know, can I do this? Can I be in this? I just want to do it. A lot of Kansas City Trucking Company was shot in Gage's home out in Laurel Canyon, where the crew built sets 
and downtown LA. Other shoots were in the desert. During production, Gage always had a UCLA student on hand in order to flash their film school card whenever needed and it did come in handy. At one point, one of the scene's footage was lost when a camera jammed up. While thinking about what to do, Boyd, who was in the scene, told Gage, just give me 10 minutes and I'll be good to go again. For the direction of the film, Gage has said not one bit of it was improvised. Every line was scripted. Kansas City Trucking Company follows a trucker named Hank, played by Richard Locke, on a long haul to Los Angeles with a newly hired man riding shotgun played by Steve Boyd. Jack Wrangler plays the dispatcher. He and Locke have a quickie before Locke goes on the road. The straight man, played by Boyd, is dropped off by his girlfriend and has sexual fantasies of Wrangler as they drive to Los Angeles. Along the way, Locke and Boyd fantasize, experience flashbacks of sexual fantasies, or pass by a number of sexual encounters on the side of the road. At the end of their journey, they both join in an orgy at the trucker's bunkhouse in L.A. The ad agency took one look at the uh, materials, advertising materials and everything, and the lady who ran the ad agency said, this is running in the subways. And she had, they, they took a full ad campaign that played in the subways. No one had done that, gay or straight, no one had ever done an uh, X-rated film before uh, with that kind of a campaign. We took ads in the New York Times before it opened. It was a big, big thing, and we treated it like a movie. Kansas City Trucking Company was released on Christmas 1976, and was extremely successful with audiences as well as highly profitable for Gage and all of his partners. It supplanted Boys in the Sand. It became a sensation. It broke all kinds of box office records in San Francisco. We opened the same week, at Christmas week, that uh, Streisand's Star is Born and De Dino De Laurentiis' King Kong. And by the third week of the run, we were beating them both. Gage has said it made him a lot of fast money, giving him the freedom to do what he wanted for a period of time. Since Kansas City Trucking Company was so financially successful, Joe and Sam Gage immediately began to plan a sequel. A year later, Gage released El Paso Wrecking Corps. This town, this job are getting on my nerves. One more three-day layover like this one, and I've got half a mind to get in that pickup and head out. You got half a mind, period. A year after that, a third film, L.A. Tool and Die, was released, starring Will Seegers as Locke's love interest as well as Casey Donovan. Hi, where are you going? Not too far, can you help me out? Oh, sure thing, hop in. My name is Fred. What's yours? Fred. Fred, that's really unusual, isn't it? Mm-hmm. The emergence of gay identity as a political concept and as the focus of political organizing was taking shape in large cities with large lesbian and gay communities. Smaller cities and rural areas, however, were still in the closet. Gage pointed his camera in that direction in order to portray the play of homosexual desire among men who lived outside of urban gay communities of New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Gage's Working Man trilogy are regarded as three of the best gay erotic films ever made to this day. Imaginative framing, creative camera work, and their implicit and explicit radical political intentions and frequent seriousness of purpose. It has the dreamy qualities of Poole's work mixed with the sexual hunger of Fred Halstead's while making the hero of the films the quintessential blue-collar working man. The film created much of the macho iconography that we have come to know and love and recycled years after. You've been watching Demystifying Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demystifying Gay Porn is available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as YouTube. Demystifying Gay Porn is on X, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram, and if you like what you're watching or listening to and want to be a part of the creative process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn, 
where you can help support this audiovisual podcast and YouTube channel, and I can continue making content like you've just enjoyed. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off. Cheers. Cheers.